Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about physical abuse and the long-term effects of it. But before we jump into that, did you know that I wrote a book? It's called Are You Okay? and it's available for pre-order now. In it, I describe the difference between mental health and mental illness, how to get the right help, and even how to deal with toxic relationships. Just click the link in the top of the description and order it now. It's available worldwide. And save your proof of purchase for some exciting giveaways and to get your own signed book plate. I hope you love it as much as I do. Just know that if you like my channel, you're gonna love this book. But now let's jump into today's topic. Now, physical abuse is defined as the use of physical force that may result in bodily injury, physical pain, or impairment. This could be anything like pushing, pinching, biting, throwing things at you, choking you, pinning you down. The list honestly goes on and on. Overall, just know that if anyone ever does something that puts you in physical danger, that is abuse and it's not okay. And before I go any further, I want to mention that anyone can be physically abused. It doesn't matter if we're big and strong or small and weak. Anyone can be a victim. If you are in a physically abusive relationship, please reach out for help. There are professionals there to support you and places you can live so that you are kept safe. So please reach out and speak up. You are important and you deserve to feel safe at home and in your relationships. But what I wanna talk about today is how being abused can affect us later in life. And of course, what we can do to overcome these effects. Now being abused at any stage in our life can lead to mental health issues. But much of research being conducted is focused on children who grew up with physically abusive parents or caretakers. And I just assume that this is because they can give adults an assessment to find out if they experienced abuse growing up and they don't have to track them throughout their entire lives to find out what happened. So it ends up saving time and money when conducting their studies. And if you didn't know this, a lot of studies are very limited in budget. So I, that's my guess as to why they do it mainly on adults who were abused as children. Now, obviously the most common diagnosis for those who are physically abused growing up is post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Because when someone harms us physically, it can cause us to fear for our life. And if you remember, that's all it really takes for us to be and feel traumatized. They also find that if the abuse continued for many years, as it usually does, this can lead to complex PTSD, which as we know, comes with regular PTSD symptoms like flashbacks, avoiding anything that reminds us of the trauma, dissociation, etc. But it also includes emotion regulation problems, forgetting traumatic events completely, kind of like repressed memories or just blocking it out, feeling very ashamed and guilty for struggling with this and not feeling, you know, okay like everyone else. We can even have distorted perceptions of our perpetrators. For example, a lot of my clients will tell me that the people who harmed them, you know, really did love them, they just didn't know how to show it or by harming us, that's the way that they showed it. And we can also struggle to relate with others and isolate as a result or even have trouble trusting people, which makes sense. If someone hurt us, it's gonna be hard to trust others. And finally, we can lose our own sense of meaning and feel really hopeless. And if you want more information about PTSD and CPTSD, I'll link my videos specifically about those diagnoses down in the description. But along with those, those who are physically abused as children can also struggle with depression and anxiety disorders. And I personally believe this occurs because if someone who's supposed to take care of us and love us is hurting us, it can make us think something's wrong with us and something we did. And this low self-esteem only feeds the hopeless feeling that can come along with depression and intense worry that we know is associated with anxiety. They also found that physical abuse is connected to alcohol and drug use as well as eating disorders. And like I've talked about over and over again, substance abuse and eating disorders are both just unhealthy coping skills, meaning that we're doing those things as a way to numb out or distract from what's really going on in our life. Because it can be hard to face the fact that someone who's supposed to love us is hurting us. And so we'll do anything to not have to think about that. And finally, their research shows that we can also suffer from medical issues not just when the abuse is going on, but they find that when we get older, we're more likely to have ulcers, high blood pressure, asthma, and allergies. The researchers believe, as do I to be honest, that this has to do with living in a very stressful environment for many years. And that kind of stress, you know, can just overwhelm our system and cause medical complications for us later in life. But enough about all that bad icky stuff. Let's get into what we can do to help ourselves heal and hopefully prevent some of those long-term effects because it can and will get better. Now, the first treatment option is talk therapy. Talking through our trauma in detail, 
Yes, I know, it totally sucks, but it's important to try because it gives your brain another chance to process all that you went through so that it no longer affects us in our day-to-day -day life. Meaning, once we process it through, we won't have flashbacks or body memories like we may be experiencing as a result of our trauma. And the next option is CBT. They have a trauma focus, it's TF-CBT is how it looks, but it's CBT trauma focused treatment. And what they do in this type of therapy is work with you on relaxation training. This could be deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, or other relaxation skills. They also help us with emotion regulation, which is like identifying our feelings, and then having tools to manage all that we may feel. They also work with us on creating a trauma narrative and processing it, which really means discussing the overwhelming events in the form of a story. That's why it says narrative. So we're turning it into a story, and by turning it into that story, we're processing all that comes up, all the feelings, all the body memories, all the flashbacks that we associate with that trauma. And finally, they work with you on learning cognitive coping strategies, which is really just a fancy way of saying identifying negative thoughts and replacing them with positive ones. I talk all the time about the importance of positive self-talk, and that's why. Positive self-talk is a huge component of CBT. And then there's also medication. Many people who have PTSD also find themselves struggling with anxiety and depression. Therefore, medication has been found to be very helpful for those who are struggling. Obviously, it's not necessary for everyone. That's not what I'm saying. But if you feel like you're just drowning in the symptoms, as always, medication can help get our head above water so we can use some of the tools that we're learning in therapy. And if you're interested in medication or looking into that at all, please contact your doctor and make sure to ask questions so you understand all the side effects and what you should look out for so you're fully informed. And finally, there's EMDR treatment. This stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. In this type of treatment, you follow someone's finger, light, or even a buzzer in each hand, and it helps our brain reprocess the traumatic information and helps us heal more quickly from it. It's kind of like our REM sleep. You know, your eyes are supposed to go back and forth from left to right. This type of treatment mimics that sensation to give our brain yet another opportunity to process the trauma. And I always talk about like inside out because I just love it as an analogy, but when we're putting memories together like those marbles, we, it might have just shattered on the floor because we didn't get all the time we needed to process it or it was just too much for our brain at that time. And so doing all of this treatment, whether it's trauma-focused CBT or EMDR or talk therapy, we're just giving our brain some time to pick up all those splinters, form them into a marble, and roll it away so that we're not, you know, dancing around all the splinters and stepping on them sometimes. That's where I think flashbacks and body memories come from. Now, there are many types of therapy and treatment out there. So if one of these doesn't work, don't give up hope. Just make sure you like your therapist, that you connect with them, and you feel comfortable enough to begin sharing. That's the most important thing. So bottom line, please reach out for help if you have experienced any type of abuse or think that you may be suffering from PTSD because like research shows and like I've talked about, it only gets worse over time and there are amazing treatment options out there to help us heal and live the life we want and deserve. But as always, what's been your experience? Did I leave out a treatment option that helped you? Let me know in those comments down below and I will see you next time. Bye.